quick word from our sponsor, uh, and then we'll be back after these messages where James will introduce our presenters for the day. So let me share this so those of you at home can see it and play this so those of you can hear it. Hello, everyone. My name is Bob Keneally, and I'm from Black Magic Design. Thank you to Simply DC for having me here to present a few opening remarks. There you go. At Black Magic Design, we are always looking to innovate, and we value our longstanding relationship with Simply. It's an incredible organization bringing together the best minds throughout the media, entertainment, and technological industries. Our most fundamental philosophy is to creatively empower end users of all levels and abilities by delivering high quality and affordable products. Technological advancements in media and entertainment are constantly evolving with new standards rapidly becoming the norm. Thankfully, we have organizations like Simpty to help navigate the ever-changing landscape. We are always working to grow alongside an industry we highly value, and we're passionate about changing the industry for the better. It's been interesting coming out of the pandemic where customers everywhere had to adapt, engage audiences in new ways, and build out new workflows to accommodate virtual events. We've seen an uptick in technologies such as remote collaboration, virtual sets, and cinematic cameras used in live settings. Also, filmmakers are capitalizing on more traditional live gear, such as switchers and routers, for their virtual production workflows and multicam scripted shoots. Now that these new workflows are in place and have provided a wide range of benefits, this cross-industry collaboration will continue to develop, especially with the ability of affordable products that allow creators to quickly and easily produce content, increase the quality of production, keep costs down, and move technology forward in a seamless way. Blackmagic Design is helping to enable creators to do this with products such as Ultimate 12 real-time compositing processors, which provides the world's best gear for combining the next generation of broadcast graphics. Our Ursa Broadcast G2 camera is three cameras in one, a 4K production camera, a 4K studio camera, or a 6K digital film camera, and it streams too. Mm -hmm. The new ATEM Constellation live production switchers include several powerful HD models and an 8K model. So users can choose the right option for their work and create virtual sets or easily handle complex live productions. We also recently announced ATEM Television Studio HD8, a new family of all-in-one live production switchers that combine broadcast features with extreme portability, as well as the new Blackmagic Studio Camera 6K Pro and Blackmagic Studio 4K Pro G2, which have built-in live streaming. Check out more at blackmagicdesign.com. Thank you again to Simpty for having Blackmagic Design as part of this event. We appreciate the opportunity to help promote the understanding around the latest advancements and working together to help drive the industry forward. Have a great night. And if you'd like that, I believe Fred is coordinating Black Magic to uh, present in the fall with SBE. Uh, Fred, any other, sorry to put you on the spot, you just walked in. Any other SBE business? Sure. Um, sure. Hi. Oh. From the Matrix. Okay, I just came in from outside. We just got some water, everybody. Uh, yeah, uh, we'll, I'll be at the SBE booth at NAB. And, um, Remember that uh, April is renewal. So there are a couple SBE members here, I know, but uh, uh, and there's still a couple days left to sign up for the Ennis workshop, either RF 101 for radio or ATSC 3.0, two-day workshop, uh, $195. It's uh, 14th and 15th, which is what Friday, Saturday, and you can take the ATSC 3.0 uh, certification afterward as an option, but only a couple more days to sign up for that. If you're an SBE member, SBE 23 is the code to put in for a free exhibit pass or 150 off of uh, full conference. And uh, the SMPTE happy hour is Tuesday, April the 18th, uh, BTS booth LN3, BTS booth LN3. So Tuesday, 5 p.m., SBE, SMPTE, and IEEE. Uh, coming up, SBE local, we have um, the SBE law update, which is going to be virtual only on the 11th Tuesday um, on the SBE.org website, all the details there, and we have uh, 
Zoom. Oh, yeah, SPE37.org for the local. And the SPE has a new website, SPE.org. Um, we do have uh, already May 18th planned for the WAMU combined antenna. Familiar with that? We got a um, three or four radio stations diplex together, and we're going to even have ERI with um, Tom Silliman in person. Any of you RF people, uh, you get to meet him and talk about, talk about the project. Transmitter efficiency, June 27th with the Baltimore and at Columbia, Maryland, the facility. Uh, that's the end of June. And we've got John. We don't have a venue yet, but we have the sponsorship advanced monitoring. Uh, August 8th is the HARP uh, project. If any of you are familiar with that, up in uh, up in um, Alaska, it's a big antenna array. The chief engineer will be explaining that. That's at the Goddard Space Flight Center Visitor Center. That's right. Yeah, he's Steve Floyd is giving the presentation, and we have uh, sponsorship, and we have the use of the visitor center, and the docents will be there too. So the visitor center will be open if you want to bring some guests and you want to see some of the space exhibits, the rocket garden, and whatnot. Um, we'll have a picnic in September, like usually. Uh, we're trying to work with, as you said, Black Magic. We'd like to put together a program on uh, setting up a three-camera remote shoot to help some of the younger people be interested in. <laughs> and that will be October, November. And another thing on the works is a vinyl press facility that's local here. We'd like to take a tour of that. And then <clears throat> December, we'll probably have the party again so that's the whole year for sbe thanks wow you guys are you guys are all planned already yeah uh eric i didn't see you so welcome as well um uh okay before i hand over to james i have uh um one quick request we request yes yes so i'm gonna uh yes so phil's gonna talk first uh about um students and while Phil is coming up. Uh, I have a need for a sample BXF file that will not be used for production. So if anyone has a BXF file, they might be willing to share with me so I can see the construct. You two on the on virtual as well. Uh, please let me know. Managers at simptdc.org. Um, Phil, I'm going to trade places. You can go and come up and get in front of the camera and talk about the students. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, just so you know, I started the recording a little bit late for anybody who's viewing this on recording. That's why you missed the introduction at the beginning. So I'm here with Joanne, Joanne Hi. Carroll, and um, the reason um, we're up here together is because I recently had the honor and the privilege to speak with the students um, at Montgomery College, and it was what was um, <clears throat> Different for them is I, I was representing SEMPTE, but I talked about being in this industry for a very long time from the sales side, from somebody who's been supporting all of you and many of you uh, I've worked with uh, directly in the same company or you are my customers or the customers of my people. And, and we talked about all the different kinds of careers you could have in this field with, the, with their engineering skills and the people skills that are necessary. So I'll let Joanne talk about how it went. Uh, I thought it was a great uh, a great guest speaker, but also a way to bring together. Uh, Phil brought in all the different sides, and I, the students don't think about engineering enough. Our student chapter does, but they uh, it really brought it to the rest of the students in this class in this management class. The class was broadcast management, and so they're they're tasked with learning all the different departments and what everything is. And so they had some really good questions. Uh, Phil presented about how about sales and management and marketing and but uh, through an engineering lens and how how important that is and um, it was really great and I was really proud of their that how excited they got about the about the topic. Yeah, I was very impressive at, uh, as to how much they were engaged and um, I would say the vast majority really had a vision of what they want to do when they finish with school. One person was, you know, kind of struggling there, but that was more mm -hmm. normal than the other, mm -hmm. you know, so it, they were, they really were focused and they were into it. So that's, uh, that's it, Sally. Right. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, and thanks for the opportunity. So the student chapter will keep going on next year. And so if anybody wants to be guest speaker, you can contact me or has some things they want to show to students, bring in and, and do a show and tell kind of thing. We'd love to hear about that. Okay.
Thank you all. Uh, that was, uh, if, if you aren't aware, um, new blood in this business is lacking. Uh, so it's, it's great that we have the students who are interested. Um, a lot of initiatives in SMPTE and uh, SBE and a lot of other organizations to bring in, uh, bring in the youngins, which I remember when I first started coming to SMPTE, I was like, wow, all of you are old. <laughs> and now I am. Uh, all right, so with that, um, let's bring up James to introduce our guest speakers, uh, speaker and presenters for today. stand right here and I realized that I should have done that and there you are thank you thank you John and welcome everyone I'm James Snyder I'm a manager of the DC SMPTE and I'm the senior systems administrator for the Library of Congress's National Audiovisual Conservation Center in Culpeper Virginia um, I'm very pleased to be here tonight to introduce uh, some new and interesting concepts that uh, I've been aware of for a while now, um, and they've gelled to the point where I think um, you will find them interesting as well. Um, our two presenters for tonight are Jim Lindner and Joseph Mark. I've known them for more than 15 years, which blows my mind. Um, starting with uh, the original construction effort of the NAVCC down in Culpeper, Virginia, more than 15 years ago. And uh, Joseph will be doing the demonstration of the film scanner that you will be seeing tonight. And uh, Jim will be talking about multispectral imaging and uh, some of the newer concepts that uh, hopefully will be uh, seen in various types of imaging, both for film scanning and in general, in the coming years. Um, Joseph, uh, when I first got to know him, was working for SAMA Systems, which was um, one of, we were one of the, we at the library, were one of the original customers for the first production model JPEG 2000 mathematically lossless archival video encoder. Uh, and we received the very first ones in early, uh, 2009, which tells you how long ago this was. Um, after the SAMA effort was done, Joseph went on to a company called Archimedia, which um, did uh, high quality um, viewing stations and um, uh, other types of uh, video related, high end video related activities. That became Gray Meta. And then Joseph went on to start working on this project, which you are going to see tonight. Um, a big part of the reason uh, both I and Joseph are here is because of Jim Lindner. Uh, Jim is a recognized expert in video preservation and is the founder and president of Media Matters LLC, a company that provides consulting services and solutions to preserve, manage, and distribute audiovisual media. He has over 40 years experience in the field of media preservation. And some of you, if you go back far enough, might actually remember him from New York City and what was it, Devlin video, was it? Yes, you might actually remember that from long ago and far away. Um, and he's worked on uh, various projects, including the one at the Library of Congress, the creation of the NAVCC, but also for the Smithsonian Institution, the Motion Picture Academy. Um, he's also a member of the International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives, which we know as EASA in this line of work, and has served as the chair of the Technical Committee on Audiovisual Archives. He's also known for his work in the development of the SAMA system, which was the first uh, JPEG 2000 lossless archival video encoder, uh, and is a big part of the reason that if you deal with IMF files today, one of the two uh, codecs inside of IMF files for production quality files, one is uncompressed, and the other is JPEG 2000 mathematically lossless. And a big part of the reason that that codec is in IMF is because those first SAMA encoders proved that it could be done and that JPEG 2000 lossless could actually work. Um, Jim uh, also has written and lectured extensively on media preservation and has received numerous awards for his contributions to the field, including the SMPTE Archival Technology Award, which uh, several years after that award was created uh, and Jim won, uh, became named after him when he was kind enough to donate uh, 
uh, the seed money to keep the archival technology metal going. And so it is now the James A. Lindner Simpty Archival Technology Medal. Um, he's considered a pioneer in the field of video preservation and has made significant contributions to the development of technologies and best practices preserving for preserving audiovisual media for generations. And you're going to get a taste of that tonight with what we're going to see here in this room and hopefully you in online as well. So Jim, welcome. Thank you. Oh, we're going to switch over. Yeah. So we need a second to uh, do our AV stuff here. <clears throat> Turn off me. Yeah. You want your video on? Your video turned on? Yeah. All right. And a little control right there. Right see, see yourself. There you are. Okay, can we move that away? Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Is that going to put up here? Okay. Great. More complicated than it looks. Um, you guys are all the way down there. <laughs> okay. I can't see me. That's about as far as I can go. You're good. Is that good? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone uh, here in person and uh, and virtually. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, a little intimidated, but uh, I feel as if I'm among, among friends. I, my history in Simpty goes way back. Um, and I was thinking um, this morning about, well, when, you know, um, you know, in terms of innovation, um, how how far do things go back? And I remember that uh, those of you who may be familiar with the New York or the New York post-production scene, and I think it's in the 70s, there was a company called Teletronics. And I was thinking that I saw the first uh, non-linear editing system at Teletronics. They called it the light pen system. And um, I don't remember what kind of a computer it used, but the disk storage was these big, like, you know, um, hat, hat uh, uh, storage devices and um, um, and um, every now and then you you know you you go to a presentation where you go like wow that that started think me thinking differently and and you kind of go back you know in this field you go like well well you know that presentation was really really different and um, uh, I don't want to be uh, uh, egocentric but I'm I'm hoping that for you tonight. Um, you start thinking differently about about some basic things that we've all assumed in our lives as as engineers and, and people who work in television. Um, and because I'm going to challenge some of some of those ideas and and um, I hope you find it. Um, I don't know if I, enlightening is the right word, but but it, it'll it'll uh, it'll suffice. There's going to be uh, three parts here. First part is uh, me uh, give, just give a little bit of background of like what we're doing. Um, the second part is uh, Joseph Mark, and Joseph is just going to give a brief uh, presentation um, of the EZ-16, which we have here, which is the embodiment of, I don't even want to say how many years worth of, of, of work. Um, it's a production machine um, we are delivering, um, and um, um, the stuff you're going to see today um, is not just like, oh, gee, wouldn't it be fun? This is actually metal, you know, parts. <laughs> CE, you know, all of that good stuff you got to do. This isn't just like lab stuff. This is this is real. Um, and then after that, I'm going to be talking uh, more about uh, color space and uh, color systems and uh, multispectral uh, uh, imaging, specifically uh, relating to the transfer of motion picture film, which is um, my area. As, as uh, James mentioned, I first started uh, uh, this adventure in preservation with video. Um, um, because I thought video would be really hard to do, um, and film, well, you know, how hard can that be? <laughs> well, wrong. Um, but video was easy compared to doing film, um, and um, sometimes it's uh, it's hard to do something simple, and um, and that's that's what you're going to see tonight. So with that, I'm going to jump in. Oh, and after after I yabber, um, the machine's here. Uh, I'd invite you to come up and look and play with it. Um, you don't need to know anything about film to do film 
transfers on the technology that we've invented, which is which is uh, kind of amazes me, <laughs> actually, after all the work. So um, it should be some fun, and hopefully you'll you'll have some questions, which we'll get to. So, um, ah, okay, well, now it's not. Okay, so um, let's talk about the, the problem, and I want to define the problem. Obviously, the world's moved on from motion picture film, um, but, um, but we still have a lot of it, and it's really important stuff. And um, film scanners and, and transfer technology isn't new. Um, I go back to uh, RCA TK77, I think, well, which is a film uh, chain, right? Um, we've been transferring film to, to video you know, we started transferring film to film, right? And then, and then, twenty-seven. Okay, thank you. Well, okay, that's fine. I probably mentioned the VTR and said, but started with TK, um, and um, you know, then and then, um, you know, we got rid of the, the the film camera taking a picture of the the projector essentially, right? And got rid of that. And with great inspiration, we stuck a video camera in front of it, <laughs> and uh, then uh, with more inspiration, we got like, oh well, there's Europe. We better do a PAL one. And then when HD came along, we, well, let's see. Oh, yeah, we'll put an HD camera in front of it. And then when digital video came along, we were like, well, of course, we're going to put a digital, digital camera in front of it. No one ever stopped to say, well, wait a second. <laughs> Just hold on. Maybe we're not doing it right. Um, and and that's that's what I'm going to be talking about. You know, just like, like maybe we need to do this right because maybe this film isn't going to be around anymore it's all deteriorating in the in the 1980s there was some work done by the image permanence institute and and um seminal work and um and what they what they figured out was that if you keep film cool and dry um it will last longer um and so everyone went out and built vaults cold vaults including the library of congress which was intimately involved with and um and at that time, they were talking about, well, how long would it last? And the uh, general feeling was, well, color films, you know, cool and dry, depending if it's frozen, blah, blah, blah. You know, about 100 years should be okay. No one ever de de defined what end of life was. You know, like, well, when is it to be said that it isn't lasting anymore? But, um, well, the 1980s was 40 years ago, you know. And and a hundred years now isn't so long, um, and and um, and meanwhile we've had scanners, you know. But the reality is, is that we have all the film still in cans, you know. That 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 the technology that we've had to digitize things hasn't fundamentally worked. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons for that, which I'm going to be talking about. And while we have all of this film, we have too much film, and we have too little time because the film is deteriorating. It's kind of like drip, 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 right? Every single day. It's not getting any better in the cold vaults. It's just getting worse and slower. And while that's all happened, the world's changed, right? You know, when people talk about the end of film or the end of film life, no one thought about, hmm, are there going to be projectors? You know, we all figured that Kodak would go out of business, you know? But no one thought about, well, what about the guy who makes light bulbs for the projectors? Well, what what about the sound reproduction systems? You know the little exciter lamps. What about the, you know, yeah, right. You're laughing. It's like dot dot dot. It's like you know. So so Kodak went out of business, but but even before Kodak went out of business, all of those guys went out of business. It's like a huge implosion. Um, when we started the this this adventure to build better technology for preservation, the last thing I wanted to do is build a film transport. I mean, geez. You know, I've been doing it for a hundred years. I just want to buy one. You know, sell me one of yours. I don't want, you know, it's like, well, guess what? There was no one to sell it. There was, no one was making sprockets anymore. You know, that, that, like, who's going to make that? You know, the, the technology is gone. And so there was, there's was there been this implosion that's occurred. Um, and the implosion um, includes not only the stuff, um, meaning the, the metal stuff, stuff you can hold on to, but it's also the people. Um, you know, film technology is esoteric, you know? It's like, well, what does this circle and triangle mean on the film to a 20-something year old? What? You know, I mean, uh, you know, this stuff just doesn't, you know, there was a reason, there was a historical precedence. People who know it are retired or disappearing. <laughs> well, um, there are less and less of us. And, and those of us who 
are still around who remember that or can find the documentation on it aren't in a place to really be involved in it anymore. And, and you know, my, my daughter went to the uh, archival program at NYU. She just got a master's in you know, archival studies. And um, I can tell you that no one in her class was looking for a job in a film lab. Imagine that, right? Um, and between all of the OSHA things and all of the, you know, where you have to handle chemicals and there's about five or six, well, I don't know how many, let's say there's 10 wet film labs left in the country, right? And, and no more are coming and no one's being trained. So we have this huge problem. We've got all of this film. We've got this backlog of content and they're all in cans and they have labels that like meant something at the time, but in most cases mean absolutely nothing now. And I'm gonna give you an example, which, which means a lot to me. And it, it was a videotape example. I migrated NBC News's um, uh, two inch quad collection a long time ago. And they basically said, Jim, here, you know, we have, they only had about for, for 30 years of stuff, they had like 3,000 tapes, that's it. So they do the math, right? NBC Nightly News is every night, right? They had about 10, they only had about 10% of it left. And so they said, well, transfer all of the stuff. I'm like, you know, it's like 250 bucks a reel. So, okay, great, nice job. So I had a reel of tape and the, the, the reel, the label on the reel said resignation slash Disneyland. That's what it said. It was, you know, Sharpie, right? Resignation slash Disneyland. Called up the customer and I said, you know, you want me to transfer this tape to the resignation slash Disneyland? And it's like, and he said, um, so Jim, we told you to transfer all the tapes, right? I said, yes. He said, so why are you calling me? <laughs> transfer all the tapes. That's the project. Okay. So what was the tape? Well, once we put it on the machine and started playing it down, it was Ronald Reagan. And Ronald Reagan at that time was governor of California. That day he happened to have been at Disneyland and made a speech about the resignation of Richard Nixon as president. And on that day, resignation slash Disneyland made total sense. And after the six o'clock news on that day, it never made any sense to anyone. And archives are full of that stuff. They're full of it, okay? We don't know what we have, but what we do know is that if we don't digitize it, there's no way to deal with it. There's no way to look at it. There's no way to preserve it. There's no way to you know, bring the, the uh, cultural material along. Digital accessibility is required. Um, and if that wasn't, all of that stuff wasn't bad enough, you know, I don't know about you, but most people want to make more money next year, right? Things aren't getting cheaper in terms of people. Things are getting more expensive. So productivity becomes a fundamental issue, right? And those are the issues that our company filmmakers is, is, is dealing with. And in order to deal with these issues, and obviously there's a lot of different issues, we've decided to, we sort of have decided to cut the cake in two pieces. There's two different paradigms that we're addressing. Um, the first paradigm, and, um, and Justin will give a demo about it, um, is to deal with low, medium, and unknown asset value car carriers, films. Well, what does that mean? It means you don't know what you got. You know, what, what's, what's in this? You, you wanna be able to digitize it. You wanna be able to do it cheaply. You want to be able to do it with labor that may not know anything about film. Um, you, want to, you want to do it fast, as in hopefully two times real time, which is where we are. We're almost there now, um, which means remember those old uh, TAC duplicator, cassette duplicators, right? So we're talking about that. You know, you take the cassette, you put the blank one there, you put the original there, and you hit start, and you walk away. And that's what we're doing. Only we're doing it for film. So. We need to come up with a system that allows it, what I call a triage system, which is what we did with SAMA, which allows a fast, cheap mass migration. And during that process, figure out the condition of the film. And when I say figure out the condition, I don't mean the way we do it now in most archives, which is like, oh, this one smells, smells like a salad bar. It's deteriorating. That doesn't cut it. And what doesn't cut it is, okay, we're gonna figure out film shrinkage by, and this is standard practice, I'm not making this up. We're gonna take a piece of wood or metal, you decide. We're gonna take a nail and stick it in the end. 
Okay, then we're going to stick the film on it. We're going to stretch it out. We're going to have a micrometer at the end and figure out how long it should be and measure the distance. And that will be how much shrunkage, how, how much shrinkage there is. That's what we're, that's state of the art until now, right? I'm sorry. We can do a lot better than that. Okay, and so our systems do that. Computers are very good at measuring things. Okay, so we do that. As part of that process, it's an assembly line, right? Take the stuff off, stick it on the machine, run it through, do it again, right? You just get it done, okay? Get it digitized. Don't mess with it, get it done. As part of that process, you go, oh, here's Barack Obama in shorts. We didn't know we had a picture of Barack Obama in shorts. Now we do. That may be valuable, and we may want to do a higher quality transfer, okay? So the first task is to treat everything the same. And during that process, discover things that are of higher value, okay? That is not the way we do it today. Today, the perfect is the enemy of the good. Okay, well, we're gonna clean the film and we're gonna repair all of the splices and we're gonna get it everything lickety-poo and it's gonna be 4K and blah, blah, blah. And I'm sorry, it's junk, okay? And so you're wasting all of your money. When I say you, I mean collectively, people with content are wasting all of their money while everything gets worse, everything gets more expensive, okay? You don't have access to it and you have no clue what's in there, but you can spend a lot of money to make it perfect. And the result is, if you've been for vaults, the result is what you see there, which is maybe 10% of the stuff is done, maybe, right? That doesn't cut it. Okay, so we've got to do something different. This is something different. So this is the Easy 16. There are two versions. There's the Easy 16 and there's the Easy 35. The Easy 16 does 16 millimeter as well as eight millimeter, as well as super eight millimeter. You can see it here. It's state of the art technology. It is all custom. All of the circuit boards were designed by us. All of the parts are machined. All I mean, this is this is not like, you know, this is all manufactured, okay? And um, Joseph is now going to give a quick demo about the EC16, talk a little bit about it, and then I'll come back and talk about um, multispectral imaging. Hi, I'm Joseph Mark. You got to come here. Take two. Hi, I'm Joseph Mark with Filmic Technologies. <laughs> I am in charge of customer care. I'm a long time uh, SMPTE member, and I would like to show you what Jim was just talking about. And many of you are familiar with the project management triangle. You have a schedule, like digitized before the film turns into a hockey puck. You have a budget, which is never enough, but it's more than zero. And then you have a quality. And so I'm going to illustrate each of those in hardware and software. Um, I can't see the slide anymore. Oh, the slide. I got Oh, sure. Cameraman Phil. <laughs> so uh, an hour ago, so it's six o'clock. Um, here's the uh, the timeline part of the project management triangle. Um, it took longer to to assemble that TV stand with a room full of Simpy engineers <laughs> than it took me to build this. And uh, there's the boxes of because that was delivered to the hotel last night. Thank you, Jonathan Solomon, for the cart, and we wheeled it in, and we. I set it there and I took the film and I loaded it up. And now um, this will run. I'm going to run it at uh, 24 frames per second real time because you're here and you want might want to watch. Jim mentioned that the operators of the future film transfers will be younger than us. Many of them will have never seen a film before and they won't know. Can you uh, camera this? They don't why when they won't know why they come with holes in the side. They won't know why it says Eastman out here on the side. 
they won't know why there's like a dual racetrack on the side. That's the optical sound. They won't know these things. But it will be their job to do exactly what I did. I went to get the film out of the box. It wasn't in a film can. It was just laying in the box, kind of flopping around. So I laid it on there, pulled it through there, stuck it to that one, and hope everyone knows how to how you lock a film down. Try it upside down, doesn't work. But eventually, you push it. In. All right, and um, so I'm going to put the fancy schmancy camera shroud on. I was showing the camera to other people. Please come up later and take a look at uh, cameras because they're fun. And um, now our eyes will be protected from the bright lights. Don't want to be blinded. And here's how you migrate a film. There's one green button on there. I'm going to click on the green one. OK, so that's how that works. Now, if you go to our website, you'll see Jimmy does that. And then he leaves the room, which is what you should do. There's nothing to do here unless you want to watch the movie. Um, I could turn up the sound and we'll see what they're talking about. Now, this is not video. What you're seeing is a lot of um, still images. They go by so fast, your brain thinks it's video. The video gets made after we take the uncompressed raw photographs. Jim mentioned uh, versions. That's a five megapixel camera, otherwise known as high definition or 2K, whatever you like to call it. And in the same place, we can put a 24 megapixel camera, which just means you have to store more stuff. But either way, the important part is you have digital access as soon as the film gets to the other end. Stick your USB stick in here, take a video, give it to somebody and they can watch it or email it to them, however you wanna do that. So <clears throat> I can see the top. Now you can see from the top. So I loaded the film, knowing nothing about the film and it wasn't in the can. Pulled it through these rollers. There's no, uh, nothing in the way. Um, this little one here is the tachometer, which is very gently and safely telling the computers and motors how fast the film is moving. And then the software does the rest. And there's the take up reel. So we also want to mention, if anyone would like to migrate a film today, please come up and do so. I have here for your migrating pleasure, an eight millimeter. <laughs> and and this one, um, the cover looks great. Um, by the way, all the uh, films that we migrate uh, online, you can have, you can browse them. Right? We have a folder of all the samples, all the gauges, color, black and white, reversal, print, negative, some more words. And we have all those. And you can look at yourself. So uh, backwards, like tail out, heads out. I didn't even check. It doesn't matter. Software will just flip it the other way and like that until it looks like a movie. All right, uh, magnetic sound. There's a thumb screw. You pull it out, you stick in the magnetic head, and you get magnetic sound. Um, and so here's the part that got me excited, really enthusiastic about joining this project. The condition report. If you were to migrate all the films you saw in that photo that Jim put up and try to watch them on your computer, you won't live long enough to watch them all. The condition report, just like a web page, you open it up and you get the name of the person who had the film last, when it was done, um, other metadata, the media info kind of stuff. And then the computer vision recognition of the film condition. How good is it? How bad is it? Which frames are damaged? What kind of damage? Just like a web page, you just flip through them. And film handling. 
Well, it's handling film just fine. And uh, all those gauges, but more importantly, if you have seen an aging film, vinegar syndrome, they smell bad. Solvent syndrome smells even worse. But some of them, they turn into like rotini spaghetti. You ever seen that in a film? Yep, definitely digitize those. They're not gonna get better. There's cupping, that's where each individual frame kind of bulges one way or the other. Like, uh, and uh, yep, digitize those for sure. And don't hang around watching the paint dry. It's automatic. So that objection is gone. How do you know the end of the file? You don't need to. My favorite part is, I hope it ends before, while Jim is talking. You'll, you'll see the machine that just does what your washing machine does. It just kind of clicks and stops. And the film will sit right there, waiting for me to come back and throw it back in a box. And uh, so mass migration. I've only got two films here today, but it, this is to, to migrate all of them, not just some of them, because you don't know what's on them all until you migrate them, until you digitize them. So do them all. And so how fast can this go? Well, I'm showing you 24 frames per second. Uh, you can go double that if you want, um, if, if you really don't want to watch. Can you speed it up now? Sure. I have a mouse. I can do that. There's a, a fast forward button. So the, the image preview stopped at that speed. Right? So the digitization is happening just fine. So let's go back to where it's oh. Yeah. It says, please slow the film. And yes. All right, so uh, the machine right now is taking uncompressed raw images. And this is a preview of what the camera can see. And from that, with it, this will render in any FFmpeg supported format that you like, a video in three different crops. We call one the movie crop because it looks like a movie. All the edges stuff, it looks like a movie. Doesn't look like this. Uh, my favorite one is called the inspection crop because it looks like a movie, except you get to see edge to edge. So you can see the Kodak words go by and you can see the optical sound. And then there's the full uh, crop, which is that in any format you like. Was that what? Now, there's also for those of you who've been working in. Uh, content management for some time. There's also metadata because it's uh, it's not a storage problem; it's a retrieval problem. So uh, there's all this information that you can import to whatever management systems you like. Um, is it dealing with the audio track of the same packs? That's correct. So the audio track comes out as well. What is the file? The well, the audio is going to go into the video format that you've selected, well, but there's is, also Broadcast wave. Okay. Where is the optical reader? It's a. Uh, it's. Can you rephrase the question? Where is the optical reader for an optical track? Uh, it's right there. Oh, it's it's, the, the it's computer vision. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's computer vision. So the computer is reading the You're image. Taking it from a manual world to a file world. Yes. So, uh, yep. I mean, what you're saying, the picture of the soundtrack is being turned into audio at some point in the process? Well, it's being turned into audio right now um, in so preview. The camera is the optical. Yes. The computer, you, the, computer, the camera is the optical reader. How do you control the gain? How do you know you're not over modulating? Sir? That's software. Okay. That's why it takes a long time to develop this. Uh, it takes a lot of testing on a lot of different kinds of films. Mm -hmm. um, I can go into a lot of detail about um, 
what happens at eight kilohertz in film, mm -hmm. for example, some of you probably know, um, and uh, all the kind of filters that may or may not make sense to the ultimate goal, which is mass digitization. Well, it's not film guys. Oh, in optical sound? Is it a harmonic or something? It's like 15 bit, 15 video? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much like that. Yeah. Uh, because the sound system that Jim mentioned uh, couldn't reproduce it. So it was recorded and nobody knew. Uh, so the last thing before I hand you back to Jim. You bet. Rotini film. Yeah. That was the film. In other words, film that is really badly warped, distorted, yeah. whatever. So you're saying that this thing can run that film and get a beautiful image out of it? Yes. Those of us who use other film scanners and especially television folks can't do that. That's right. How does it do that? You mean how does it take a twisted film and make it look flat? Yeah. Yeah. So what, um, see, that's what it does when it's done. <laughs> um, so the tension between the rollers, someone else saw that earlier. Yeah. Um, it's, there's three basic tensions, you know, loose for the Rotini film, generic for that, and tight if you want to ship your film, as Jim mentioned, for further examination by an expert because you found Obama wearing shorts. So, so it'd, be, it'd be much like transferring a cinescope film where it's anamorphic the same way that the, the film then. What he said. So uh, you probably all have a video editor on your laptop or on your phone. Those can fix that. If, if the image is really not that understandable, mm -hmm. that's what video editors do. Can you answer that question? Mm -hmm. About the, the curvature film. Unlike any other film scan you've ever seen, this scan has no date. Uh, I'm, right. I'm astounded. There's no date. There is no date. Right. Nothing but air. I'm not the word. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I'm 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 I worked in film half my career. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Right yeah, please do. And I just want to say, I spent four years um, day to day. Not Jim was it's his vision, but I spent four years in the trenches working on that problem because it's an electromechanical problem. The mass is here and it has a rotation, which means that it has vectors and they change constantly at any speed, right? You saw me speed it up. You can go slower if you want. And then the mass moves over here where it has a different circumference and a different. That's a lot of spreadsheets, folks. <clears throat> and I, then I have to do it with all the films we can find. Yeah. And we did. It takes time. Yes. Is there, is there a point of focus between the light source and the lens where the film passes through, or is it is it an infinite point of focus? That's a very good question. Yeah. So and, can I hand it to Jim to yes. talk about depth of field and those kind of things? Yeah, right. There's so, a lens so right way, here. Yeah. If you want to see me adjust it, um, but, but there you is turn a, the knob and you move it back so forward. But you, you have to focus on the film plane. If there is a point that says I'm going to focus on the film plane. I'm let you Take it away, Jim. Let me answer your own question. <laughs> okay. What's your depth of field at F16? Nope. I'm going to make it, get this one out of the way. Throwing up light at it, you can. I'm going to draw a bunch of light on this plane. LEDs are amazing. Is there a workshop? The, 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 amount of, the amount of light coming out of the LEDs that we have here, which is the proper amount, no, you can adjust it, is 20% of what is possible with those LEDs. Okay. It's an array. I think I have a, I'm not sure I have it here. I have a picture. Well, you can, you can see it after. And there's no heat, right? And I'm getting towards the film. I mean, there's like no zero heat, right? So, so why do we not have a gate? I'm going to get to that in a second, okay? But um, I'll just go, I'll just move on. Because otherwise, I'm not going to cover everything. Can I ask a business question about this? Sure. So, how much does it cost? 
$30,000. There's thousands of users, right? Oh, come on, stun silence, $30,000 for this, okay? Compare that to uh, other other efforts with 8 million rollers on it. And, you know, the, the, the scanner field is stuck back in the 70s with like 800 rollers and mm -hmm. it's nuts. It's $30,000. How about all the and we will rent it to people. You know, my mission is to get film digitized. That's my mission. You know, I don't know if we'll make any money. money. I mean, nice nice. Did, but that's that. I, you no, know, I'm talking about like, do you have workshops for people to demo it or use it? Or this is probably not a politically correct statement, but it's a true one. So the the person who is in charge of really customer care in our in Baton Rouge has a son who's challenged, a challenged son. Mm -hmm. And he comes to work with dad, you know, after school. And he learned to be an operator. And his teachers were really surprised because it was like, how could someone with the, that skill level be able to do that? Teachers asked permission. And we facilitated them bringing the entire class to teach them how to be operators. These are people with very limited skill sets, mm -hmm. okay, to, to be an operator. So the whole idea was to make this so simple that it can be done. It's gotta be cheap and it's gotta be simple and you can't be a film expert. And we can't be talking about, oh, well, you know, um, um, you know the, sp the sprocket holes on this stock were oval and the ones in the stock in 1953 were, Come on. Does that answer your question? I, I don't want to, I have a presentation here and I don't want to, I could wax philosophical for a long time, but 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 you haven't you haven't seen the money shots yet. So um so I'm gonna continue. Um okay, we have plenty of time for questions after. We spent a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of energy designing this platform. You'll see the bottom part of it is a Dell server. The actual telecine part of it, telecine part of it is only the top half. Okay, these are flat motors. Okay, these are robotic robotic motors. The reason we have the Dell server there is so you can take it anywhere. You don't have to worry about you know disk disk storage and we're moving all that data and all of that stuff. It's there. It's right there. You can bring it to where the film is. And you know what? If it breaks, Dell has a service network. I will come. Lady will come and they'll fix it. Okay. So it's designed so that we can mass produce it. It's designed so that it can be cost effective. And it's also designed so that we can do other things with it, okay? Which is what I'm gonna get into right now. You see it says platform similar for both systems. The EZ35 is virtually an identical machine, except the lenses are different. The illumination area is larger because it's 35 millimeter versus 16. So it's like that versus that, right? More LEDs, not a problem, okay? Um, um, it also is not the same machine as this. There's an easy 35. The most common question is, why do you have two different machines? Why don't you have one machine do all of it? And the simple answer is, is the cost of doing one machine that went from eight millimeter to 35 millimeter was more expensive then if we had two different machines doing those, that's the answer. And of course, the obvious answer is you could have two people working at once or one person doing two jobs at once. So this is all about productivity. The SAMA system that I designed, you know, I'm not a genius, right? I, what I just did was I was just figured out productivity. You know, it just does more, faster, better. That's, that's what it's all about. Let's talk about better. So far, we've been talking about getting it out of the can. We've been talking about streamlining, changing the paradigm for mass digitization so that you can actually get it out of the can so you can save it before it's too late. Let's talk about high asset value. And that's gonna take us into a very different place, okay? We're talking about digital preservation quality for important and valuable assets. This is probably the first time you've ever heard anyone have the guts to say, Digital preservation value for important assets. People will say, oh, we do 8K. Oh, we do 12K, uh, not 12K. We do 8K, we do 4K, we do 5K. I'm not talking about that. 
I'm talking about a digital preservation system for capturing all of the information from motion picture film because guess what? It's deteriorated. Okay. I'm not talking about, oh, gee, that's a pretty picture. Okay. Nonsense. We're moving on from that. We're talking about the creation of a data representation of film. And I'll talk about that in a second. It is unprecedented and upgradable, high precision capture in both resolution and color depth. And I'm just going to answer the questions for you right now, because I know you're thinking, what does he mean about unprecedented color depth? 160 bits of color depth per frame. Think about it. 160 bits of color information per frame. Compared to what? Compared to what? 16, 24, right? Depending upon it's log or linear. Eight bits per channel, right? 160 bits. It's an order, it's more than an order of magnitude better. Okay. It also has to be upgradable. I'm sorry, it's stupid. You buy a scanner for $300,000. Oh, we want to do something else. You have to throw it out and get another one. That's ridiculous. It's a total waste. The system is designed, and you'll see over here, the camera is on a sled. Remember tripods? Right? There's a sled on there, right? You know, you want to put another camera on there. You don't have to throw the camera away. You don't have to throw the tripod away. You have to throw the whole Megillah away, right? You take it off and you put another camera on there. Duh. Okay. The system does that. I should mention in these systems, we're using a computer vision camera. We're not using regular old RGB cameras. Why are we using computers? This is the only machine that I know of that's ever been designed to use computer vision cameras. The reason is that computer vision cameras offer the ability to measure things. Measuring is important. It's really important. Okay. You can't measure quality if you can't measure. Okay. This is designed. All of our systems are designed with what I call open engineering. Open engineering is not open source. Open source makes no sense when you have to deal with the machine's ballistics. When you're moving a carrier, open source, what? You're going to get in there and change the ballistics on the, the FPGA? No, I don't think so. You're not going to be doing that. But what you really need to do is you need to say, you know, for this film, it's really kind of shrivelly. We need to get something in there that I'm going to 3D print that costs me, I don't know, a dollar fifty, and it's going to hold the film just right, this particular film. And when we're done with it, you know what? We're going to throw it away because we don't care. Okay, it's open engineering because of the fact that there are weird things that happen in film. Okay, so rather than have a gate saying you will look like this film. We're saying, no, 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 the film's the boss. The gate isn't the boss. And if you need support for that, we're going to make a space. And if you come up here, you'll see that there is a space in between the lens and the illumination source. Why? So that you can put things in there that you design on a 3D printer. The world has changed. 3D printing is amazing. You can do wonderful things, and it's cheap. And you know what? You can hire somewhere between 14 and 18 year old and for a high school project you say you know we have this film it's like that we would design a 3d printed thing for them and they're like oh yeah i can do that <laughs> right am i right yeah yeah and they'll love to do it right <laughs> here's a gate open engineering ken weissman did that by the way ken weissman is on our team ken was a former head of the uh the uh, the motion picture lab at at lc um, so this is a, this is one that Ken designed. We haven't built it because we haven't had a need to yet, but this is just an example of a support for a 35 millimeter film that needs edge support, basically a track on either side. And we're going to build it for like, on a CAD CAM system, it's going to cost us like, you know, $2. We're going to try it. And you know what? We don't like it. doesn't work. The film doesn't look good. Okay, fine. We'll spend another two bucks. And make another one. And we don't like that one. We're, gonna, we're not buying a gate for $5,000. It's dumb. Okay? We've got to move on. So this is here an example of open engineering. <clears throat> we're going to be talking about a multispectral system. By definition, a multispectral system is a system that's using different filtered lights, light sources to scan film in narrow bands, and I'm gonna be getting into, into that. Here you can see, this is an actual CAD CAM drawing of what it is. 
And you can see that there are multiple light sources. There are nine at the moment, but that may change. Each one of those light sources has multiple LEDs in it, okay? So we're getting away from, okay, there's the white light source. We're not gonna have white light sources. We're gonna have multiple light sources of different colors. So there's some fundamental differences between a multispectral system and the system you see here, but it doesn't matter in terms of how you transport the film, hello? The 35 millimeter film. So we're saving engineering money by using the same platform for the Easy 16, for the Easy 35, and for the Rainbow. Okay. Let's talk about here's the meat of it: a data centric representation of film. What does that mean? How many people have you done color correction of film? Everybody. How many people have been able to get? a shirt, this color, doing color correction in film. Uh, How many of you? No one, no one. I'm sorry, cyan doesn't exist in film color correction, right? Doesn't, doesn't exist. You can't, you can't get it out of, I don't care what color correction system you're using, you're not gonna get this color. You can't reproduce this color. And I'm gonna get into that. So the idea of, preserving the film, all of the film information means that we're not going to play these little games of like, oh, well, if we do this, if we take the green out and put a little bit more of it. No, we need to preserve the data. That doesn't mean that we're going to use it for production, but it means that we're going to create a database for each film frame. Okay. It's a different way of thinking. Okay, quality is not based upon what your vision is, because guess what? You have your own light issues. You have your own eye vision issues. You have your own cultural biases and color. And you know what? We're dealing with preserving Gone with the Wind. The fact that, oh, it looks a little too red. No, no. What we need to do is we need to capture all of the information so that for the rest of time, people can go like, you know, I want it to look a little bit more blue. Why? Because that's what I want. That's what I want. Okay. And you'll be able to make as many derivatives as you want because you're starting with the master data representation of what was really there, not what was went through this weird color correction nonsense. Okay. Let's look at what that means. Okay. Let's look at a curve. And what we're going to do is we're going to slice that. Okay, in monochrome slices. Let's talk about that. Analog film preservation has been around for a long time. What are the primaries in film? Color primaries. People know this. Are they red, green, and blue? They are cyan, yellow, and magenta. That's why you can't reproduce this color. Film was never RGB, folks. Never. <laughs> never. And that's a huge problem because this is the color spectrum, okay? This is what cyan, yellow, and magenta map to. And you know what? When you actually, and this is actually from a presentation from, um, uh, from <laughs> it was a rip -a -matic off of the internet. It's from the Academy. I won't say who did it but it's from the Academy talking about film preservation. And they say all three records form complete color spectrum. You know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, no, <laughs> not even close, okay? This is the visible light spectrum. Cyan, yellow, and magenta can't do that, okay? And now I'm gonna to explain to you why you've had such a nightmare doing color correction your entire professional life. The reason, is because cyan, yellow, and magenta, which are the colors of film and the wide band filters that are used do not map to R, G, and B. They fundamentally are in different color space, right? No one knows that, right? And let's look at that. Look at these arrows. Look at the spaces now that the, the Y axis is sensitivity and the X axis is frequency. Okay, look at, look at the arrows where you have the sensitivity below yellow or even better between yellow and magenta. Okay, this is film sensitivity and this is a plot of two different film stocks. This is real world, this is the actual film. 
Okay, well, <laughs> what about the colors in between yellow and magenta? Well, what does that say? That says basically you can't capture them, okay? Because the data isn't there. What happens when you try to reproduce them? What do you get? You get noise because there's no data, okay? There's nothing there, okay? And because the filters are so wide, if you look at the cyan filter, what happens in analog filters, and I'll get to them in a second, what happens is you have to bring that cyan down to an RGB value for that pixel location, okay? The filter is too wide. So you're not getting an accurate value for where it is. It's misplaced, it's wrong. The physics are wrong. Film is not RGB. Film is the thing on the left, okay? It's a, a bunch of layers. Okay? And when you look at a very a pixel location on film, you're not seeing a red, green, or a blue on film. I dare any of you to show me a red, green, and blue pixel on film. There is no red, green, blue pixel on film. What there is is there's a specific location, and there's a spectral profile at that location. But we go, well, it's a film camera, it's an NTSC camera, a PAL camera, put a digital camera there. No! It makes no sense. Because RGB values are not able to capture a spectral curve. It doesn't work. Well, in a perfect world, what does RGB look like? Now, this is like a mathematical wide band RGB curve. I'll, get, I'll show you in a minute what an actual camera looks like, because no camera looks like that. Okay. But this is what RGB should look like. And when we actually look at that, there's some huge problems with wideband analog filters when you only have one RGB value to pick from. For that one pixel, I've got one RGB value. And yet I've got these huge monster wideband filters. Okay, so let's look at B. Let's look at B1 and B2. What's going to happen in B1 and B2, right? B1 is a brighter value. B2 is a lower value. Notice that the difference in color frequency, guess what? Brightness trumps anything, right? If I have a pixel that's this bright and I have a pixel that's that bright, which value is going to be captured in RGB? The brightest value, okay? If I have a lower value that's slightly lower in color frequency, what happens to that information? Gone. It's not captured in the first place. Do you know why you can't increase it if you want that color? It's because there's no data there. Because it was taken out in an analog filter. This is how every single sensor, this is how the sensors in your cell phone work. This is, this is everything, okay? Let's look at G. Here's another example, G1 and G2. Notice that G1 is at around 500 nanometers and G2 is at 550 nanometers, right? One is lower frequency, one is higher frequency. They're the same brightness or luminance value, if you will. What number is saved? The one in the middle. It's an average, right? It's an analog average in light. What's saved? What is saved is a value that is representative of neither of the two. Right. Not only is it wrong, but it's wrong to the point where the where what the color that's captured is totally wrong. And the worst example that I have here is R1 and R2. R1 sort of was very similar to our brightness thing. Okay, that's the one that's going to be picked. But if you look at R2, R2 is in the space where the green filter is capturing information also. So now you have the additional error associated with having like in areas where you have two filters overlapping. Oh my God, this is a nightmare. And this is why it's never worked. Everyone's worked really hard to get it as good as you can, but it doesn't work. We all know it doesn't work. Here's another reason why it doesn't work. Let's look at the left chart. This is an actual response curve of a um, Nikon D300. Decent camera, decent sensor, nothing wrong with this camera, another one of the sensor. And if you look there's on, online, there's tons of these, right? Look at this. Do you see any flatness going on? <laughs> do, you see, do you see any linearity in any of these? 
right? Look at the blue versus the green versus the red. And then look at the blue coming back up at around 750 nanometers. It comes back up, right? Okay, why does that happen? It has to, it has to do with a bare array. Does everyone know that the sensor underneath in your camera, whatever camera it is, it's actually a monochrome sensor, right? Everyone know that. So how do you get the colors? Spray paint. That's what it is. It's spray paint. What they do is they spray micro lenses and micro filters on top of the sensor. There's, there's a glass essentially separating it. And that's how they get the colors. Okay. So you have these wideband filters being sprayed on top of the monochrome sensor, which means they're in slightly different locations by definition. Okay. That's a huge problem right there. Okay. But then also look on the upper right side and you'll notice some of our friendly, we'll say the economies that were taken because human vision is more sensitive to green. How many times have we dealt with that in our professional careers? Oh, well, the reason it's 422 is because the human eye is more sensitive. Oh my God. Oh my God. We've got to get past that. And I'm gonna show you how we're gonna do it. So you, you so if, if all of the stuff I've just showed you isn't bad enough, on top of that, the filter, which is filtering the light, the photons that are getting to the sensor are inaccurate because they are not accurately represented by the, by the same amount of filters. There aren't the same amount of filters. There's a lot more green filters than there are blue and red. Does that mean you're gonna get as accurate or enough accuracy in the data for blue and red as you are for green? No. Does that make sense to your real life experience? Yes, it does. That's why black and white isn't black and white. Because the sensors have bare filters on them. You can't get black and white. Oh yeah, I can turn the chroma down, but the data is still there. And that's the whole problem right there. So what does that look like when you mix all the stuff I just said? Okay, well, it says title. Okay, that's good. If you, if you, if you map the cyan, magenta, and yellow layers for the RGB hypothetical filters, not the real ones, the hypothetical, look, there's a huge mismatch. Color spaces are wrong. They don't map. And you probably knew that before coming here, but you probably never really thought about it. Okay? There's a huge mismatch. Okay? So how do you fix it? The way you fix it is by using multispectral imaging. Now, multispectral imaging, what's that? Multispectral imaging is not new. Multispectral imaging goes back to the 1960s. It's used in lots of things. It's used in medical imaging. It's used in satellite imaging. That's how the pictures got to us from the moon, right? They had a black and white camera that had color wheels. That's how they did it, right? Multispectral imaging has been around for a really long time, okay? But it's never been used to capture the information from motion picture film, or for that matter, in broadcast cameras. Does, am I implying that there should be broadcast cameras that are multispectral? Yes, I am implying that. Okay. And I happen to believe, hypothetically, consider I've been researching this for five years, it could be that there are people working on that. Does that mean that there is display technology that is not necessarily just RGB? Yes, there are some patents, patents that are filed for that new kind of display technology. So we're not stuck in an RGB world forever, okay? So what do we do? We have to figure out a different way of, of filtering that makes sense. And the way we do that is we slice up the spectrum. We've chosen to slice it up in 10 pieces. Why? Because it's convenient, okay? Each filter is the same bandwidth. The peaks are the same. Okay, we also have, we have actually have seven small narrow filters and folks, this is just like audio. I'm like describing to you the first audio equalizer that, that for light, right? This is like, remember tone controls? That's what we have now. <laughs> this is multiband equalization only for light, okay? Let's superimpose, let's put all of this information together Let's look at the cyan, yellow, and magenta curves, and let's look at multispectral capture of information. And you can see marching along, 
we have the same amount of data being generated with the same precision as we march up the spectrum. That's the whole point. Could you use more than 10? Absolutely. Okay, our system doesn't care. If someone came to me from, I don't know, pick a studio, and they said, well, you know, Jim, we're doing Gone with the Wind, and we need more illumination in blue because there was cyan dye fade, okay? And so we need more LEDs there that are more, we want the filters to be narrower. And I'm like, that's cool. We don't really care what the 10 bands are. You know, if you have something that you need to do, we'll engineer it for you. There's going to be a charge to do, the, to do it, but why not? So if you look at cyan, yellow, and magenta, all of a sudden, it makes sense. All of a sudden, there's now a way to capture that information, which is uniform and consistent and makes mathematical sense. So what's the filmic rainbow? The filmic rainbow makes 10 individual monochrome exposures for each 35 millimeter film frame. Okay, this is not real time, folks, but you know what? We're doing 101 Dalmatians. I don't care. It's been sitting in the can for 100 years, another 100 years in a week. Okay. Okay. The exposure takes a 30th of a second for a layer. That's fine. What's the rush? Okay. Because it's gone with the wind. Okay. Each exposure uses a different light source. It's accomplished by using narrow frequency LEDs. There are other ways to do it. You, one could use a filter wheel as an example. There are hyperspectral cameras, which work differently. Part of an extended discussion concept that's important. For the rainbow, each exposure is 16 bits deep. 10 exposures, 16 bits deep, 160 bits of color information. No one's passed out yet. That's pretty good. And how much resolution? A whole bunch of resolution, a whole bunch, okay? We're talking about gigapixels. Forget megapixels, we're talking about gigapixels. Each black and white exposure will contain 1,024 megapixels, okay? So what does that mean? It means a 90, well, you know what, actually that's, uh, no, each, no, that's wrong. It's 102.4 megapixels. Each exposure is 100 megapixels. There are 10 exposures so that there's 1,024 megapixels represented for each film frame. I didn't explain that properly. A 90 minute film feature film is approximately 250 terabytes. And I've had people go like, oh, that's so much storage. And I'm like, I had a computer animation company that folded in 1990. The entire company, we were pretty, we had 40 people. The entire company had almost a gigabyte. <laughs> Almost. Not quite. It's Gone with the Wind. I don't care how, how much storage costs. If you can afford gone, to own Gone with the Wind, you can afford the storage costs. And if you can't, why are we having this conversation? Okay? Storage costs isn't the cost of LTO tapes. Come on. 10 band capture. That's what we're doing. It's a whole different paradigm. Well, how? We're using narrow spectrum LEDs, and I'll show you those in a second, that are in a matrix that are sequentially illuminated one uh, uh, illuminated per channel. You saw those reflectors, right? That means that there are 10 different LEDs in each of those reflectors. We do that because we want to get very diffuse lighting. We want the light bouncing all over the place. We're, we're very, we use diffusion filters. We're very wasteful for light. Fine. If the exposure instead of a thousandth of a second is five hundredth of a second, I don't care, right? We use a modified high resolution medium format professional camera. Okay, we're using a, a Fuji GFX one hundred S flash S. Okay, now the first thing that I hope you are thinking is, hey, wait a second, that camera has the bare filter on it. It has those little spray painted RGB filters on it, right? We scrape them off. We do. It's very complicated, but that's exactly <laughs> what we do. We turn it back into a monochrome filter, a monochrome sensor. Okay. The illumination comes, you can see it here in the CAD CAM drawing, comes through a sphere, like a hemisphere. Okay. So the light is coming from all the different angles, it's bouncing all over the place. And you can see the camera. Fuji camera right there. 
And there's a couple of reasons I'm going to get into why we use professional cameras. <clears throat> this is the illumination housing. You can see the little LEDs in there, and you can see that they're all focused on the target. And target is basically where the film is. Okay. How do we do that? We use different color LEDs. You can buy LEDs that are very specific and where they use mostly scientific applications. They're made by Philips, not a trade secret. Okay. And they make lots of them, all different frequencies. Okay. You can choose what you want. As I said, you need a certain kind of blue because the data is too close together. Great. So what are the advantages of using this particular camera? Oh, and I should mention that the rainbow was designed to get rid of the camera when Nikon comes out with his new blah, blah, blah model, or Canon comes in with his new ipsy dipsy model or whatever. I don't really care. What matters is the quality of the, of the lens system. And those of you who have ever looked to purchase a scanner, they'll say, oh, it's a 4K scanner. I'm sorry, that's nonsense. What matters is the resolution, resolving power in lines per inch, okay? It's the whole system. It's not just the sensor, the resolution of the sensor. And any of you who have a cell phone that has 64 megapixels know for a fact that it doesn't really look so hot, right? Why is that? Well, because they're very small, right? So we use a sensor that's very large and the resolution, is like mind blowing, okay? We're talking about 12K, okay? And we're talking about capturing the information as data, okay? It's a different way of thinking. There are different native resolutions, okay? Based upon the way the data comes from the sensor, it's all raw capture. So the resolution is 16 bit 12K, 16-bit raw, it's medium format, I'll show you that in a second, 102 megapixels per exposure per channel, 102 per channel is one gigapixel of data. That's how we get to that. That's a good question. Um, it depends upon the, the yeah, and it depends upon, it, it happens to be a very low noise sensor. Um, so, the answer is yes, but we don't want to operate on unscreened. Right? We want to stay where there's no noise as much as we can. This is a comparison of the size of sensors. So these this is a medium form. So those of you, well, I know Carl, for example, is a photographer, among other things. Um, you know, bigger negative, better quality. I mean, I'm sorry, you know, it comes back to that. You want to capture more photon information because the more information you have, the higher the precision, the higher the accuracy of the information. So we're using a medium format sensor. The lenses are really important. You know, you can't do this kind of work and not consider the lens, hello? You know, it's, it's not about the resolution of the camera, of the sensor, it's about the whole system. You know, what is the resolution that's captured throughout the entire system? And one of the reasons we're using the Fujifilm stuff, and one of the reasons we're using professional cameras is because, guess what, they're tested. Not by the scanner manufacturer, but by professional photographers because this is what they do for a living. You know, Canon comes out with a new lens. What do they do? They test it. It's all on the, online, it's all there, right? They also, because it's a medium format lens, um, a sensor, that means the lens itself is larger. What does that mean? Those of you who are into photography, a larger lens means what? Less distortion because you're using less of the bad part of the lens, okay? And we also stop it down, depth of field, which means we're getting the best part of the lens too. So we're doing everything we can to optimize the quality coming through the system. Question about um, these multiple light sources mm -hmm. are, um, they are presenting to the film at different angles, right? There's one, one in the center, some of the outside. And I know in some, in, in some light source system, whatever lights coming, different colors lights coming from different areas, there's some type of aggregating sphere to uh, to even out any light quality. We're doing this. We are. Uh, I can ask you a question. Yeah. Okay, we're wasting gigantic amounts of light on purpose. We're not looking for coherent light here. Okay, we're looking for as diffuse a light as we can possibly get. That means we want the light to bounce around. Okay, 
So oh. is, is one side of the film uh, be, because of the fall off in light? Because you're it isn't the because it's a it's a sphere. Yeah. Okay. So it goes around 180 degrees around, right? And there are reflectors all along that, and there is diffusion material in front of each reflector. Okay. So we diffuse at the source, not at the image plane. So the light getting there is diffused to start off with. Does that answer your question? Like using an HMI. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you just go out. Why do they look so much? It's 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 softer at the end of the day. I mean, what does that mean exactly? But that's what it is. So each 10 exposures, well, how do you look at it? Okay. Can you take all of this data and just, you know, stick it up on your, you know, Photoshop and look at it? No, because it's a data representation, right? Each of the 10 exposures is a is part of a data cube representation. You can't have all of the data unless you have all 10 layers. Okay. So how do you look at it? And the answer is there's open source applications looking at multispectral software. Because they've been doing it for since the 1960s. NASA has open source stuff. There's there's lots of stuff. And what we're doing, and I'll get to this in a second. What we're doing is we are building middleware so that this will hopefully work with the color correctors that people are familiar with. We don't expect people to get rid of their resolve or whatever they're using. Okay. We want this to interface with that, which means standards. Okay. We'll talk about that in a second. So the films derived from the master film frame look something like this. Here's the original film frame. And you'll see each of the 10 layers, each layer, 102 megapixels, 16-bit black and white. And you see DNG. Does anyone know what DNG is? Digital negative. Thank you, someone, whoever that was. And what what is, if there was a standard in still photography, what is the standard? Uh, to your doctor? Yeah. Mm -hmm. DNG is a packaged, a standard packaged version of raw data. Okay. And it's supported by Adobe. It's it's uh, license free. Okay. It's as pretty much as open source as a company like Adobe would ever make it. Okay. The data is there. The important part about it is as a container, the DNG file is sort of a container. Okay. It has tons of room for metadata. And you can actually put, so Fuji. All there's like 500, something like 500 different raw what? file formats. <laughs> Nikon has theirs, and China has theirs. DNG aggregates, yeah. okay, and it sort of filters the data down into one common way. But in addition to that, because I'm insane, in addition to that, the DNG files allow you to put in the original right from the camera also. So if you've got the storage, we've got the data, okay? If you want to take the DNG normalized data, it's not really normalized, but it's, it's, it's packed. That's a better way of saying it. it's packed. If you want to also keep the original, that's fine. Instead of one pixel, mega, uh, gigapixel worth of data, you got two. It's gone with the wind. Who cares? <clears throat> this is what it actually looks like. It's a stack of monochrome layers. It makes no sense to look at it with your eyes. You kind of go like, where's the color? It's data. This is a visualization of data. Okay. This is the gate that I showed before. So how much is this going to cost? We are aiming for $100,000. So you know, a regular scanner, an 8K scanner, right now, if you were to buy one, it's not multispectral, doesn't do any of this stuff, is $300,000. So we're starting at one third of the cost. And we're hoping that by using a common platform, we're going to make a lot of these chassis and that's going to drive the price down more. Because the goal here is to get everything preserved. For clarification, if you could repeat the question, because I don't hear it. Oh, sorry. So you had mentioned a $30,000 cost earlier. $30,000 is for the easy 16 we don't have a price for the easy 35 yet but it's going to be similar in range you know it's going to be more expensive because there's more stuff you got to do but 
the easy the easy 16 with a, a five megapixel camera is um, thirty thousand dollars and and we're not doing the automobile business stuff right we're not going like well you've got mag wheels and you know it's thirty thousand dollars operable system does everything you need if you want to upgrade to a, um, a 12 a 24 megapixel camera um, easy <clears throat> that's an additional ten thousand dollars everyone is signing up for the 24 megapixel camera i wish they weren't Really, I wish they weren't because it you don't need 24 megapixels to see the image. You don't. The other distinction is that's RGB line still. It's yes. Mm -hmm. so yeah. The, RGB versus multi. Yeah. Can you repeat that for us? Yeah. So the, the question was, um, or the, the comment was that the um, the EZs, the EZ16 and the EZ35 are, 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 are RGB cameras, right? Because you're doing this triage process. Oh, Barack Obama in short pants. That's valuable. We're gonna put that on the rainbow. Rainbow isn't for everything. Rainbow is for high value assets, which we talked about at the very beginning. Thank you. Yeah. So in the um, in the 10 light sources, you you um, you expose one, you expose them in sequence. Yes. And capture each one individually. Yes, they're 10 frames. Um, is the film just registered uh, electronically where basically the system reads the frame edge and, and, and yes. holds it stable? I mean, it doesn't, doesn't need to It's not moving. Or edges, right? No, it's the so same it's exact transport. The same exact transport. And, and, but, and the, the, the position of the film is, is, is calculated based on the frame edge uh, controlled by the software. It's image processing software. It's actually not that hard. Compared to doing it at 44 frames a second, it's nothing. Yeah. So it's contactless. Pin yeah, and it's not moving, right? You know, when things aren't moving, it makes it a lot easier for registration. I mean, you know. And that data is part of the data, right? Because you have the ten different layers, you can see the sprocket holes. If you want to, if you want to do stabilization, as an yeah, example, it absolutely. The That's the whole idea. We're yeah. put. We're we're saving. The film. It could be shaking all over the place. We don't care. It doesn't matter. I want to see what that John Ford film looked like in 1950 when it was released and the lenses were crap. And there was no air conditioning in the movie theater and there was, right? And it was and using an arc lamp, right? But what, what did it look like? You know, I don't know. But you have the data to figure that out and you haven't had it before. Impossible to do. Impossible. So, I hope, I hope you're going to look back in your careers and go. You went to this meeting with this guy wearing a cyan shirt, and at that meeting, you realize that it's all going to change. And the reason it's all going to change is not because I'm just trying to sell stuff. The reason it's all going to change is because the stuff we've been doing is wrong. It's always been wrong. You just never stop to say, well, can we make it better? I can't tell you how many film to tape sessions I was in, you know, as a producer, director in the early parts of my career, where we're going like, you know, we had the, the Pogo, I think it was, you know, and we're going like, mm, you, know, well, you know, we really want the Coca-Cola can to have that kind of reddish orange. Good luck. Right? Can you get can those of you who have done it? Can you get a Coca Cola can that okay. was shown on a film? You cannot do it. Right? Can't do it. No one can do it. Now you know why. And it's never been able to be done. Handled reversal, same as negative film. Doesn't matter. Same data. Right? It's the same process, and that's really important. Right? You want to take the same. Oh, there's some other things in here which I haven't talked about. LEDs are sensitive to temperature. Color frequencies and LEDs will change based upon temperature if you're not careful, right? So we have um, thermocouples on the front end where the LED, you know, that are exposed, if you will, to the film, and on the back end where the heat sink is, so that we know for the exposure what was the temperature of that thermocouple. And, and we're still working on this, we're going to have a spectrometer in the system, okay? And we're going to get the metadata from the spectrometer. You're going to do an alignment frame, right? You're going to have to align this, right? And so, so we think the color, the, the peak 
of that LED is 450 nanometers. Was it? It doesn't matter so much if it wasn't provided that we know what it was, right? Because we have all the data, we can filter it, we can mask it, right? So we're gonna have inf uh, spec uh, spectrometer data in there. We're still working on that, exactly how we're gonna do that. I'm not sure. Yeah, what would this work look like in a perfect world? Be a flat line. We're getting there. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you have, you start running into like um, economies of scale. Well, I don't know if that's the right word, but you, yeah. you, you, you know, you start running into like, okay, how much more better is it statistically if you do twenty lamps versus ten, right? You start you start running into this thing where okay you go from ninety percent accuracy to ninety one point oh three percent and so you know is it worth saving twice as much data or four times as much data for that and we think that this will be adequate there will probably be our our system doesn't care our system looks at the LEDs themselves as a matrix it's a circuit that just turns circuits on and off. It doesn't care about how many LEDs there are. So we could get more LEDs into the system. The problem becomes one of the physical space that LEDs, LEDs are getting smaller. There's some new technology coming out that will change it. And then also the heat, dissipating the heat. We're also looking at, and this is stuff we're looking at, um, if, the, if the heat sinks over time aren't adequate enough, and we'll know that because of the thermocouples, then what we're going to do is we're going to use we're going to we're going to cool it with water, which is what's done for lots of other things. Like any of you have an overclocked computer chip for gaming, same basic idea. You just want to get the, you want to pull the heat away. Um, you know the problem with that is just getting the getting it where you want it. Just getting the getting you need to pull the heat out. There are also heat pipes. That's another way of doing it. Right now we're we're now right now we're getting good results just with a heat sink. Okay, but it's also hasn't been running for, you know, 100, 200, 500 hours. So the LEDs come up, they get, they're turned on. You don't make an immediate exposure because it takes about a second for the LEDs to sort of settle down. So this is not real time. Maybe someday. Carl. Actually, as, as we all sort of scratch our heads over, a discussion which in a sense has a, its implied use case recreating the color that's in the film itself in fact the use cases in most instances are going to be on the one hand for non-fiction material often the goal is the reproduction of the artist's intent by john ford which is a matter of correcting the color on the original film as much as it is reproducing it. The use case for uh, that's for fiction, for nonfiction, the use case for documentaries or say news footage like Barack Obama is often correcting the scene rather than correcting to the source film. So it's possible that once you've gotten this good set of data, it's really pointless to try to perfect it further as though what you're trying to do is reproduce what the film has as its color, since the use cases are correct to scene or correct to artist intent. I'm going to quote um, Man Who's Passed Away. His name was Phil Middleman. How many of you saw Tron? No, the film Tron. Um, that film was made by uh, Image. God, I can't remember now. Image International, we're in Westchester, New York. It was Phil Middleman's company. And Phil Middleman posed in his retirement speech, and I was there, early days of computer animation. Phil Middleman proposed the following, called it a law, I'm not sure it's a law, which is that animators will use the square of whatever computer power you have. <laughs> Doesn't matter how much power you have, they will use the square of it because it's the aesthetic, right? It's the aesthetic. How, how much do you want to 
to make it look like? How much time are you willing to invest in it? How much, how important is it to you? I'm a, I'm, I'm a, a director. I'm making another feature film and it looks this way and I want this footage to look that way because that's what I want. Yeah, well, again, I think it's likely that your data set will be adequate for those causes. Oh, yeah. Because you're not trying to get back to what that particular technicolor faded dye transfer looks like. No. You're either trying to get the scene or intended. I, I, we're, we're trying to preserve it as accurately with with the least amount of opinion. Well, it's the same thing that underlies camera raw sensor data capture, which is what usually happens in DMD, which is the idea is you've got enough data there right. that person A, person B, person C can output it the way they want. They can do what they want. I'm I'm you know, we're we're you know, there's lots of color correctors and lots of people that use them. I'm totally okay with people using whatever tools they want to get it to look whatever they want, what they, ever the way it wants to look. But let's start with real data. Well, they may want to get back to your sign on shirt, so you've got to have them up to work with for that. And there isn't a reason that you now know. Any other questions? Or? Does anyone have any questions that's on Zoom? If you do unmute and see if we can hear you, if not, type the question in the chat and I'll read it for you. Not sure right now. It's done silence. That's all. Well, I, I want to I want to thank you for your patience and for for listening to this. It's it's not your normal presentation. I'm aware of it. You know, but and, and it takes, you know, for me, it took a long time before for me the light bulb went on, you know, and before I realized, and then trying to explain it to other people's heart because we all know RGB, we've, we've it's our whole career. Maybe they should have chosen cyan, yellow, magenta, maybe, you know, maybe, but that isn't what happened. And, and, um, it almost doesn't matter because cyan, yellow, magenta as choices for primary would have been just as wrong as RGB because it's just color space is too wide and the filters are too broad. It's just like audio before multiband equalization. You know, I want to hear that symbol just sounding like the symbol and I don't want to raise everything. I just want to hear, you know, from 10 to 12 kilohertz, that's all I want to boost. You can't do that now. But you can with this. I'd just like to say what I said to you earlier today, now that the old group is here, is that it is incredibly amazing the simplicity of the mechanics of this unit here compared to the telecities and everything and then that it's what do you what I like as I told you, my chin hit the floor when I walked in Thank and you. saw that. And, uh, and he took it out of the box it worked. Yeah, we took it out of the box it worked. <laughs> yeah. And we, you know, we've talked about, you know, it needs to be the iPhone model. What's the iPhone model? Well, you have a, you know, it's wrapped in a white box with a, the plastic on it. You take it out and you plug it in and it says English. Okay, let's do the rest of it now. And it's done. And it works. And that's it. I remember how complicated the light path was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And you know, Abbott came along and simplified it, squeezed the spectrum. You know, it's only as good as the, the file that came in, right? right? Yeah. You don't have this raw original to play with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We lost some stuff. Yeah, for sure. We lost, we lost a lot, a lot of stuff. stuff. You know, I'm amazed. I, I, you know, one of my stepkids um, got a got a new camera. Because the camera, it's, it happens to be a Fujifilm camera, comes with pre programmed filters in the camera that have the film look. <laughs> ah! Killed me. <laughs> Killed me. But I, you know, it's our money, 36 years old, buy your camera. What's really neat about this is that you've taken so many new technologies and so many different pieces, spaces from the software. Where GoPro, we had to unwork it because it was worked. So that 
that was that we keep technology has raised to a level and you're ready for the future where it's even smaller and cooler. You've taken technology, software, hardware, light, sound, all of those things, and sort of taken pieces of them all like a Venn diagram, and you found in the middle exactly what, what works for them. So it's a, it's a great testament to you guys and fact that you had to knew what was needed and what was wrong and could find a way to fix it. Oh, uh, you, you made my mouse. <laughs> I'll give you money later. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, the other thing is, you know, years ago when this stuff started, you were working against a lot of stuff that you don't really have to work against anymore. That's right. You had to work against the, you know, the chemistry in the film and yep. phosphors in the screen that All of really it. weren't accurate and, you know, well, got, we, got we could have a long conversation about media, it. So. We could all have a conversation about NTSC, right? Mm. Oh, <laughs> but I mean, you know, one of the reasons that NTSC is what it was is they started with a monochrome system. That's right. They had this much bandwidth, and so they it was it was one of the first compressed systems. That's right. Because the color difference signals have less bandwidth than well, the Luma signal. But, but monochrome was compressed too. I mean that's what that's what fields were all about, right? And and and, and the the and the phosphor, the phosphor lag, made up for the compression, sort yeah. of, and in a very analog well, way. Things that you know, if you can get back to the original film stock of things, and say, oh, we're going to be able to eliminate all this other compromise, you may see things that nobody ever saw. Well, you will. I mean, you know, the the obvious point here is that. <laughs> I'm not going to make any friends the life. Okay, Library of Congress people, close your ears. Is that all of the stuff that's been done has been done wrong? Hello? It's been done wrong. I'm not talking about the stuff that doesn't matter because stuff that doesn't matter doesn't matter. Let's find the stuff that does matter out of the stuff that doesn't matter. We can't afford as a society to keep all of the stuff of everything just because. You know, there's a whole curatorial side of this, right? But the stuff's going to have to be redone and preserved as data. And I remember early on, and you'll remember this, Carl, it's before your time at, at LC. But I remember having conversations at the Library of Congress, and at that time, so this is 2001, 2002, okay? And the conversation was, well, do we save it as beta cam SP? Do we save it as beta cam as digital beta cam? Yeah. And I was saying, no, we need to save it as data. And I have to tell you, that was a real hard sell. Sony came in and said, well, we've got the solution. We're going to get a video server. You may have known this. I don't know. We're going to get a video server and we're going to use MPEG 2 to preserve the nation's heritage. It's me, I'm Paul Schmuck, and there's Sony. I don't want to say how much money they were paying me and how much they were paying Sony, but let's take a wild guess. Sony got a lot more money than I did, right? So who are they going to listen to, me or them? Then, I, you know, we're all lucky. A codec that is now aged out of Yeah. 20 years after that comes. That's right. That's right. I never expected JP 2000. I never expected JPEG 2000 to last as long. I mean, just consider, two, we're talking about 2001, 2002. File formats were coming fast and furious. You know, remember TIFF? The answer to that is, which TIFF, Jim? I think there's seven of them now. Well, in active use. Preserving everything, you, you, you know, you keep things that you don't think are useful because, and, and, you know, later they become useful. There are audio recordings out there right now that I I, I remember one specifically that we talked about. Was I think it was done at Carnegie Hall, and there was a, essentially a defect in the HVAC system in the hall, and so the recording was distorted by this the fact. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to the tape that was recorded before the Orchestra played and the audience was in the room and everything. You have a perfect image of that defect. That's right. That you can then stick in a computer and say, "See that? Go subtract that out of the finished recording." I'm going to have to pay you too because 
part of this is that if they hadn't bothered there's that part of the page. There's no sensor. There is no sensor that's perfect, folks. There is no sensor that's perfect. Okay. There isn't any. So what are we going to do? Exactly what you said. What we're going to do is we're going to make an exposure of the sensor without anything else, right? With a basically a blank field and find out where the defects are. Oh, this every all the other pixels are at 255, 255, 255. This pixel is at 253, 255. We now have a mask that we can invert and we're gonna save that as metadata so that a hundred years from now, they can look at it and go like, oh, the, the system wasn't perfect. Yes. It might be. And in fact, for the same system over time. It, it probably will. I have, I have a so, mode in my still camera that will take, that I use it to do astrophotography. Yeah. Right. That'll take a 30 second exposure. Well, there's going to be noise in that. It's not yeah. always the same noise. But it immediately also takes a 30 second exposure with the shutter closed. Uh, and it says, now I can see the hot pixel. Yeah. And any of you video people remember the Ampex? I think it's VPR three. Yeah. Okay. What are the, what 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 happened in the Ampex VPR three at the beginning of the recording? It was real quick when you hit record. No, what it did was it actually laid down some video, and then it rewinded. Oh yeah. Right, Doctor Snyder. Yeah. Rewinded and then re realigned the playback circuits based upon the known. Recording that was good, right? It, it did all of that. It's the same thing here. Oh, so stop and think. Was it VPR5? Uh, I thought it was VPR5. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, no, this was the most expensive one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that open gate information could be very interesting? Absolutely. Also, absolutely. We don't have so there's something done in film transfer, some some film I don't agree with strongly. Um it's, it's called liquid gate printing. printing. And what you do in liquid gate printing is you take the film and you you basically float it in trichlor or perk or some very nasty chemical, right? And and the idea is that the because of densities the fluid fills in the scratches so you don't see them, okay. And and but guess what? When you do that, you've now lost all that data forever, right? Because you first of all you're not capturing the data; you're just capturing the picture, right? So you don't have the data. So you can do if you went back for the three color negative for technicolor films or the inner negative. You know, because you're doing this off the of prints quite often, and there's a lot of data that's lost. It it, it could be uh, well, it could it could be done off of any. I mean, the rainbow can be done. Oh, well, this can too. Doesn't care, but but um, but yeah, could do that. We're we're working on a version. Uh, we're we're not done. We're we're working on of the easy sixteen. How many of you have flatbed editors that are still in service? Like movie olas or cams, or <laughs> yeah, you're laughing. There's thousands, thousands of them. Yeah. yeah, there are, and and they use them every day to look at movies, right? They're used in libraries, they're used in all sorts of places. Okay, well, we basically can defeature the EC16 and do that. Can I make an announcement? Sure. As of today, the EC35 is for sale. That's true. You are the first to know. It's true. Of the well, low, low price <laughs> What he said. <laughs> We're not sure. It's so probably going to be somewhere it? around fifty thousand dollars. Somewhere. It's good. We we want it to be cheap. We want we want the, we want the stuff to be migrated. And there's no one who, who will come to this company. There will be no one who comes to this company and says, "We want to transfer our stuff, and we can't afford it." Okay, we will figure that out. If you come to me earnestly and say, we want to do it, but we don't know how to make the numbers work. Help us do that. We will. We will figure out how to do it. We will rent the machine. What's the rainbow out of the 
rainbow is the... Well, the rainbow is the multispectral system. Oh, and that is multi yeah, the rainbow is multispectral. That's not, that's, that's the development. Right. Well, well, you're, you're hoping, hoping to have the first ones out this summer. It's, it's. Yeah. I mean, you said, oh yeah. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's. I mean, I can show you pictures of it. It's, it's on the, the future and, comes faster than you think. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's an interesting point because I've been around long enough to know that the way you developed machines was using machine shops, right? And you went through this very long, very complicated process. Of getting things machined, getting circuit boards made, all of that stuff, right? It's all changed. Those guys are gone. It's all changed. Like 3D printing. You know how long it get, takes us to get a new roller? You know, like to the 35 millimeter, 60 millimeter rollers that are on the machine? Guess how long it takes us to change that to get a new one? Take a guess. Six hours of printing? Two days. Two days comes by FedEx. It's a company that just does that. We send them a CAD CAM drawing. It's like, oh, okay. And it costs like, I don't know, 50 bucks. And what material would you like it made out of, sir? The world's changed. It's totally changed. And it's really exciting because it means that things like this are, are possible. It, this could not have been made five years ago. Well, we started to try to make it. <laughs> Couldn't think of it. Uh, last question, because okay. it's starting to get late. One of the most impressive things about this is all of the technology is very understandable. And it's, you know, you mentioned things like a Dell server, FFM, you know, 3D camera, and solar cell LEDs. From your perspective, though, what's the highest risk for part of this part of it to replicate or to keep in production? The hardest part right now is what's affecting the rest of the world. The, the magnetic heads, as an example, guess how many companies around the world that make magnetic heads? Remember, like those of you studio audio, right? Grew up in that world. Guess how many companies there are that in Germany? There's one. There's one company. We put the order in for our heads in June. We just got them last week. Last June. So that's the answer to your question. It's it's it's. Hmm? Are you ready no, no. There, we we tried to get someone in this country, and they came in all excited, and and they're like, they didn't have the stuff, couldn't do it. Germany? No, it's in Europe though. Doesn't matter. I mean, if you want to order, start now. So I got to. If you really, if you really want to know, I'll tell you. Well, that sorry, that's what I'm yeah, no, it's it's just the cameras, the computer vision cameras were having similar problems. It's not not as bad as the heads, but you know that, that's, that's our, our you know, because there aren't that many people buying heads right anymore. I mean, high quality heads. So on our on the easy machines, so this is what we did because of the fact that the person who's playing it back doesn't know anything about film, right? They're going to put the film on there backwards so that the magnetic material is not against the head, right? So then what do you do, right? So what we have is we have studio quality heads, which are very sensitive, so that we can actually read the sound through the film. That's how we do it. Is it perfect sound? No. Is it enough sound to know what the guy's saying? Yes. Is that enough? Absolutely. If you want perfect sound, there's a rather ways of doing it. Yeah, call Bob Hyber up and he'll do that for you. And it'll cost blah, blah, blah money. But it's enough to know that it's Barack Obama. And that's the point. The good, the perfect, has become the enemy of the good. And that's to all of our disadvantages. Yeah. Hey, everything doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't. Yeah. Well, but if you uh, done done not perfect, done not perfect is something I can find routinely. If you have a hundred thousand hours of film that's rapidly deteriorating, it doesn't matter if that sound is going to be high definition or not if you never get it in. That's right. So that's exactly get it all in fast. That's right. And, well, the sky, the sky, the sky is falling. I can't put that in my computer. Oh. It's awful. Right. <laughs> well, you can't yeah. open up that button where, where the pump holder comes out, and it's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what's what's it do? What's the worst part of this whole thing? Is is what's at risk? 
You know, I mean, some of us in this room have been around long enough where we remember very gifted directors and producers and people, editors that we work with. They're not around anymore to say, hey, transfer this one. This is a really good one. They're not around to protect their material. So the only way we can do this, the only way we can find out what treasures we have as a society is by digitizing all of it. And in order to do that, it's got to be cheap and it's got to be done by people who don't know anything or not capable of it. We need people who are who have challenges to be able to do it. It's a good job for them. Mm -hmm. They can understand how to do it. They don't need to be technical. They, they, they can understand simple things to do that. And that helps all of us. And that's the way it has to happen for us to say that. And if we don't, we don't. It's gone. And we don't have much. We don't, we don't have another 60 years to figure this out. <laughs> Look, video outputs on a USB stick, <laughs> except I don't have a USB A on my phone. <laughs> so <laughs> the USB stick is empty because I kept trying to plug it into my phone. No, oh, but the business card, I'll give you a link. You can uh, download it to your own phone. Yeah, okay, so for those of you who are in the room, we've got a few more minutes to take a look at the scanner and talk to Joseph and Jim. For those of you who are online, thank you for joining us this evening. We'd like to thank uh, Black Magic for uh, providing us with the uh, delicious food that uh, we had here tonight. We want to thank uh, Jonathan Solomon and the folks at uh, Amazon Web Services for the room and the facility. This was a great place to meet, and thank you all for coming, and thanks for uh, for Jim and Jacob for taking the time to be here with us tonight. And so that wraps up this meeting and see you all next time. No, 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 no.